turn to Acts chapter 1. We're going to wind up there in a minute or two. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. It's good to be here this morning. And uh, Lord, it's good to sing about your resurrection. And thank you, Lord, that what you are and who you are and what is coming, Lord, is very bright because of that. Now, Lord, help us this morning as we look at this great subject this morning. We pray that you would make it understandable. We pray that you'd make it live. We pray that you would make it apply to the hearts and the situations, Lord, of every person that is here in Jesus name. Amen. You know, um, they call this Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday, whatever you want to call it. And um, and of course, the, the theme of this day and of course, the theme of our songs uh, this morning is about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know, there's a lot of doctrinal beliefs that people have and um, and that we have. And, and that's a good thing. Some people think that's a bad thing. Uh, you know, you ought, you ought to believe if you're going to believe something, you, you really ought to believe it. Um, and you ought to have something worth believing. Um, but there are some things that really are not that important. But the resurrection of Jesus Christ is very important. It is a foundation of everything that we believe and of, and, you know, just everything. It is mentioned 104 times in the New Testament. Christianity is the only religion where the one who founded it is still living. Buddha is dead. Brahma is dead. Muhammad is dead. Karl Marx is dead. There is not anyone on earth who founded a religion who is not dead and buried, and you can find their tomb and you could produce their bones. If you had the bones of Karl Marx, you could still be a good communist. If you had the bones of Muhammad, you could still be a good Muslim. If you had the bones of Brahma, you could still be a good Hindu. If you had the bones of Buddha, you could still be a good Buddhist. But if you had one little tiny bone from Jesus' finger, you could not be a good Christian. But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up if the dead rise not. Jesus said he would die and raise again on the third day. And if the resurrection is true, then Jesus is truly the son of God. And, you know, you've got, you know, all the pagan mystery religions, you know, the mystery religions of Rome and Greece. And, you know, they have all their legends about Bacchus and Orpheus and Hades and the underworld and Adonis coming up. Um but, you know, there's a reason why they call that mythology. Because, you know, somebody made it up. But with Jesus Christ, we are dealing with a case where 500 witnesses say that he rose from the dead and they saw him and they ate and drank with him and handled his body. Um, this is the great miracle. And all other miracles rise or fall on this one. If, if the resurrection is true, then it's very easy to believe all the rest of Jesus' miracles. Look at Acts 1, verse 3. Well, uh, verse 1. Luke is writing, and he says, The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. In other words, he's referring back to the book of Luke, and he said, he said, Theophilus, he said, you'll remember that first book I wrote. And he said, it was about what Jesus began to do. Verse 2. Until the day in which he was taken up, after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. 
to whom he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. It says Jesus showed himself alive by many infallible proofs. Boy, that word infallible is a pretty strong word. Infallible means not capable of an error or a mistake, not even capable of it, entirely exempt from any possible error. That's, that's a pretty important word in that text, wouldn't you say? But if you have several of the new Bibles, whatever proofs you have, they're not infallible. Several of them have the word convincing. And, you know, a lot of people read that and they say, well, you know, you know, isn't that really the same? But it, it's not really the same at all. You know, Johnny is accused of breaking Susie's baby doll. And so you're you're trying to arbitrate this situation and you're trying to figure out. And Johnny is swearing up and down and he's giving you all his alibis and you really don't know who to believe. And you say, well, Johnny sounds really convincing. Um, that means there's still a chance that Johnny is a liar. But the proofs of our Lord's resurrection are infallible. And there were many infallible proofs. And Jesus made sure that it was so. What are the results of the resurrection? Well, one of the things it does is it proves the existence of God. Because if there is no God, how did Christ rise from the dead? He rose from the dead because a living God resurrected him. If there is any God up there at all, he can raise the dead. You know, Paul looks at Agrippa and he says, why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? And if there is a God in heaven, every man, woman, and child on this earth will have to stand and give an account for the life they lived. And the only way that can be done is for that dead person to come up at a future date. That's why all the Greek philosophers, you know, Plato and Socrates, and the list goes on and on, they, uh, they all rejected a physical resurrection. And that's because they did not want to be held accountable for their proud, filthy, immoral lives. And God said, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. The Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise that they are vain. The world by wisdom knew not God, but it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. And if there is any God, there has to be a judgment. And if there is a judgment, there has to be a physical resurrection. You know, today, man, throughout history, you know, it's it's all been about, you know, conquerors of this land and this land and this land. And today, you know, it, it's still going on. But the mightiest conqueror is death. And death is still walking across the land and it's digging a trench across this world and it's filling it with the dead. And death is no respecter of persons. Lenin died. Stalin died. Marx died. Darwin died. And they all died, and they didn't come up the third day. The resurrection is the greatest power because it breaks the power of the grave. You know, there's nothing in anything that Lenin or Marx or Darwin or Mao Zedong ever taught that could get them out of the ground after they were buried. Nothing. But we can triumphantly say, oh, death. Where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? Victory is ours if you're, if you're with Jesus Christ. Jesus says in the closing book of the Bible, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. I mean, he, he controls hell and death. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us.
You know, one of the key words of Christianity is the word everlasting. Everlasting. Many of you could quote John 3.16. Many of you learned it as a child. Many people, if, it, if they only know one verse, often they'll know this one. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You know, in Daniel chapter 12, uh, speaking of a future day, it says, and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. If something is everlasting, as, as God uses the word, it's really a simple word. It's not rocket science. It means it lasts forever. Nothing can ever end it or mess it up or else it would not be everlasting. If something depends on man, it cannot be everlasting because the trademark of man is change. And man's tendency is not to be stable or steadfast over a long period. You know, some of you guys, you know, some of you ladies, you know, I don't know, you know, the one of the glories of Facebook is, you know, you can you can revisit all your high school buddies from years ago. And uh, but, you know, any of us that have lived a little while, you know, one of the things that is just very, very, very obvious is. Wow, do people change? And we have changed. That is a mark of man. The times change. The fads change. Opinions change. For something to be everlasting, it can only be if it rests on an unchanging God who rules and overrules all. In Deuteronomy 32, the Lord is speaking and he says, I lift up my hand to heaven and say, I live forever. It says in Psalm 90, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. You know, Jesus Christ came to the earth and when he came, it was really eternal life stepping into this little thing we call time. You know, there's about 6,000 years here. And man, God started a clock, you know, 6,000 years ago. And, um, and it's been running. And it's this thing called time. But God is outside of time. God is in eternity. And I mean, it's, it, it, it's you know, one of those things you can't comprehend. It just, it had no beginning. And it has no end. And man, you live in this little dot called time. And Jesus came and he was eternal life in a human body. Look there, if you if you can, at 1 John. The book of Revelation is the last book in the Bible. And if you back up a few pages, you'll see three little books. 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. If you look at 1st John chapter 1. First John one verse one. And John is describing his earthly time with the Lord Jesus. He said that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word. You'll notice it's capitalized. It's always a reference to Jesus Christ of the word of life for the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the father and was manifested unto us. He said, you know what we saw? We saw eternal life in, and it, it came in a human body. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth and the life. The life. You know, Job said long ago, if a man die, 
Shall he live again? And then Job said, you know, a long, long time ago, he said, I know that my Redeemer liveth. And he said, after my decease, I shall see him. He said, after the skin worms devour my body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. You know, if all you got is this world, if all you got is this 70 years, hey, listen, haven't a lot of you, haven't you already lived long enough to know it's just one big unsatisfying dead end street? You ever wonder what some people live for? And of course, you know, suicide, it just, it just keeps going through the roof and it's getting younger and younger and all that stuff. If all you got is this life, you sure don't have much. And man, does it ever fly? And Jesus was everlasting life. We sing that song, uh, And Can It Be? And it says, Tis mystery all the immortal dies who can explore his strange design. But eternal life died on the cross for you and me. Everything about our Lord is ever lasting look at first timothy one first timothy one back up a little bit to the left there and you'll see several little books in first timothy one verse 16 and paul has been talking about his own testimony of what the lord jesus did for him and in verse 16, 1 Timothy 1, verse 16, he says, How be it for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Now unto the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Man, in those two verses, you have the word everlasting, and you have eternal and immortal, and you have forever and ever. That's a big pile of everlasting. Everlasting. Look at Deuteronomy. That's the fifth book. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 33. Deuteronomy 33. Look at verse 27. Deuteronomy 33, verse 27. It says, The eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. And the Lord is writing this to his people. And he says here that underneath them are his arms, but he describes them as everlasting. Everlasting is one of the key words of the Christian life. I don't know what you have this morning. Um, you know, um, you know there's, there's no peace or rest there's no peace in the in the face of death. There, there's, there's just no peace anywhere unless you have something everlasting. And you're only going to get that from God and his son. The everlasting arms. Underneath are the everlasting arms. That's refuge. He says there, the eternal God is thy refuge. It's safety. It's a hiding place. It's protection. It's support. David said, hold thou me up and I shall be saved. David recognized that he could do his best to keep himself out of trouble, but the best he could do would never be enough. And he said, but God, if you hold me up, he said, your arms are never going to get tired. And there's no way I'm going to slip out of your arms. 
underneath. He said, Lord, hold thou me up. He said in another place, Lord, you have a mighty arm. He said in another place about the Lord that his right hand and his holy arm hath gotten him the victory. You know, Song of Solomon is a book in the Bible that's a love story. It's There's really no other book like it in the Bible. It's a short book, and it follows, you know, Psalms and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. It's considered one of the poetical books, and it's an amazing story of several chapters, and it's a about a, a man and his wife, and, and they're, they're madly in love as you read the story. But it's a picture of a couple things. It's a picture of Christ in the church, but it's a picture of Christ and the believer. And she's always talking about her beloved, and he's always talking about his beloved. And it says this, His left hand is under my head, and his right hand doth embrace me. In Isaiah 63, speaking of his people, it says he bare them and carried them all the days of old. In Isaiah 46, he said, and even to your old age, I am he. And even to whore hairs, whore hairs is silver white. And even to whore hairs will I carry you. Do you know anything about that? Do you understand that? Some people, it's like, it's like a, well, that sounds really nice. And, and some of you, um, you're living in that. Um, are you there um, with the everlasting arms underneath you? There is no safer place. We sing that song, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. And one of the phrases says, safe and secure from all alarms. In other words, there's nothing that's ever going to come your way if you're a believer. That's going to take God by surprise. Now, it may scare you to death. But underneath are the everlasting arms. Those arms never grow old. They never atrophy. They never lose their strength. He never has a sugar loaf. No, he's as strong today as creation morning. And it says he stretched out the heavens with his outstretched arm. The everlasting arms. Everlasting. The Lord preserveth all them that love him. Everlasting arms. But there's something else that's everlasting. Again, at the back of your Bible there, uh, go to 2 Peter. You've got Revelation, the last book. If you back up, you'll see those little books, and, and you'll see First and 2 Peter. Go to 2 Peter chapter 1. He said, I raise up my hand to heaven and I say, I live forever. Man, they took him and they nailed him to a cross and his body died. I mean, the Bible says he tasted death. But you know, he lives forever. And the life he gives is everlasting. And three days later, he got up out of a grave. Because his life is and the life he offers you. Is everlasting. You know, some of us are getting a little older. Most of us are spring chickens, but some of us are getting a little older. And uh, you know what? We, we've watched, whether you're young or old, most of you have seen somebody in your family, some friend die. You know, if they knew the Lord, you know what they did? They just, it was just like walking through a door. You know, if you have Jesus Christ, you have everlasting life. And you have that life right now. This body's going to grow old and die. But, you know, uh, they're going to lay this body. But to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And everything's everlasting with him. Everlasting. Second Peter 1, verse 10. Wherefore, the rather, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This world for the last 6,000 years is all about who's going to run things. 
you know, in Isaiah 9, verse 6 and 7, it says, you know, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And it says, of the increase of his government, there shall be no end. It says the government shall be upon his shoulder. You know, God has a plan. He has a coming government. And his kingdom will be everlasting. You know, this, this earth is just, um, it is a monument to how, you know, rulers can, even some good rulers, you know, they can do well for a time. But the problem with that is they, they never last too long. But there is a kingdom coming. It says the zeal of the Lord of hosts shall perform this. God is, he is zealous about his coming government. And the earth has never seen anything like it. It will be the perfect government. It will be one man, one perfect man. No committees, no congresses. No parliament, no lawmakers, no high courts. It will be ruled by a king who is absolutely holy. And he is the high king of heaven who loved and died and rose for his people. It is the only government that will ever be without corruption his subjects are not robots. They love him passionately. And again, this government will never end. His government will never lose popularity. His government will never lose momentum. There's that little phrase there, and we have no clue what it means, but it's pregnant with meaning. It says the government will be upon his shoulder. And it says of the increase of his government, there shall be no end. So something's going on out there in eternity. And not only does he have a kingdom, it's, it's ever growing. And the tide will never turn. It will be like everything else about Jesus Christ. It will be eternal. It is an everlasting kingdom. You know, we, we live, some of us do, you know, we live in a state of, of uh, hit and miss and rather constant frustration about the kingdom that we live in. But, um, but the Lord said, if you can just hang in there a while. He said, um, I have an everlasting king. And it is coming. But there's another thing that is everlasting. And it's something that you wouldn't expect. And it is connected with the resurrection. In Isaiah 53, that story about our Lord's death, it says he was wounded for our transgressions. You know, on the day of the crucifixion, he was beaten. The Bible says he was scourged. He was whipped with a cat of nine tails and it was a, you know, a little short whip with, with nine strands on it and bits of bone and steel and, and um, just brutal. Many people who were scourged never lived through the scourging. Uh, many died while it was in progress from shock and loss of blood. It says the plowers plowed upon my back. They made long their furrows, deep, tearing, horrible wounds. He was wounded for our transgressions. They put a crown of thorns on his head, you know, and, and you know, they, they, they didn't just put the crown of thorns. You guys know, you've heard all this before. Those thorns weren't the, you know, little tiny ones. They were big, long ones that grow there. And, and they, they didn't just, you know. They didn't just, you know, gently set it on his head. They, they rammed it on his head. And then they says they smote it with the reed. They, they, they're going to make sure that thing's not going to come up. They're going to anchor it with those thorns. And they're, they're beating that crown. You, you can just imagine, you know, you just imagine. We have no clue. 
They tore his beard off his face. It says, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. In Isaiah, it says, many were astonished. At the, in other words, they were astonished. They were shocked. When Jesus came out of that judgment hall that day and the crowd saw him and they laid that cross on him, they were, they were shocked. And this was a crowd that had seen other people crucified. And they were shocked at what they saw. It says his visage was so marred. Visage, the dictionary definition, it's your face. His beard ripped off, the crown of thorns on his head, just flesh and blood. And uh, it says his visage was so marred more than any man. They pierced his hands and his feet. And of course, at the end, to make sure he was truly dead, the soldier at the foot of the cross rammed a spear into his side. So he breathes his last breath there, even before the soldier does the spear thing. And they take him down. Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea take him down from the cross. And Joseph of Arimathea puts Jesus Christ in his own new tomb. And of course, you know the story, and that's why we're here today. Three days later, Jesus walks out of that grave. He rose from the dead. And he had this resurrection body. It was, it was his body, but it was, it was different. You could still touch it, and he could still eat. But he could literally walk through a wall. He could appear and disappear, and yet it was still physical. But there was something about his appearance that was interesting. In John 20, that's the, the day of the resurrection, Jesus appears to the disciples. They're all in that upper room, and they're all gathered there because they're afraid that they're going to be next, you know, that they've, they've killed Jesus, so now they're going to come after us, and they're, they're there for fear. And Jesus appears to them. And they recognize him instantly. But on other occasions in the next few days, they don't recognize him. In Luke 24, around that same day or two, Jesus appears to two of his disciples on the road to Emmaus. And they didn't recognize him and something supernatural was going on. But Jesus said their eyes were holding. Somehow they, they didn't recognize him. In Mark 16 it says, after that, he appeared in another form. So, man, once Jesus rose from the dead, it was him. And sometimes they recognized him, but, boy, something sure was different about his appearance. But there is something that is everlasting about our Lord's appearance after his resurrection. After his resurrection, he is no longer marred. He is not a scarred, hideous mess. But notice John chapter 20 with me. John chapter 20. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John 20, verse 26. Now the Lord has resurrected here. And now it's eight days later, verse 26. And after eight days again, his disciples were within and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, reach hither thy finger and behold my hands and reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side and be not faithless, but believing. Look at Luke 24, Luke 24. 
Let's back up to the next book back, Luke 24. Luke 24. Verse 36. Luke 24, verse 36. And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. Now, so what the Lord has done here is they're they're all meeting there, and suddenly the Lord doesn't walk, the Lord doesn't knock, the Lord doesn't come through an open door. He just suddenly he's there and he's standing in the midst. Verse 37. And so the natural reaction is verse 37. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, why are you troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. You know, our Lord, after his resurrection, he's no longer marred. He's no longer hideously disfigured. But there is something that he carries with him beyond the grave. And he carries five wounds. He carries the wounds in his hands and in his feet and in his side. And he tells them, hey, guys, it's me and I'm real. Yeah, it's different now, but I'm real. Touch me. Stick your hand in my side. We sing, arise, my soul, arise. And the third verse says, five bleeding wounds he bears, present, received on Calvary. He retains five wounds. Wounds, And you say, well, you know, that was just for the resurrection. Well, Zechariah 13 speaks of a future day and of the Lord Jesus. And it says in that future day, and one shall say unto him, what are these wounds in thine hands? Then he shall answer, those with which I was wounded. In the house of my friends, he was wounded for our transgressions. It says, they shall look on me whom they have pierced. You know, one thing that's everlasting about our Lord, all his, the life he offers is, is everlasting. And you know, much of this world will be forgotten. And you know what? We wouldn't want to remember this world. This world is, and I think when we get to the other side, if you're a believer, if you're a believer, you get to the other side, you see heaven and all that God has prepared and the angels and the golden streets and, and just the rewards and the fellowship and that. It just be, it's going to be unbelievable. And you know what? This, this world is like, you know, you, you don't even want to think about this place. This, you'll just realize, man, that was junk. And you'll just be glad to be rid of it. You'll remember this place where you grew old. You'll, if you did, you'd remember this place. You'd remember all your bad decisions. You'd remember all your painful mistakes. You'd remember all the things you couldn't undo. You'll remember all the opportunities. And thank the Lord, it says in that day, it says this formal world will not come to mind. That's what it says. But there is a little tiny reminder of something. You know, you'll, you'll look at the Lord and you'll say, He's the one, and they sing his praises through the endless ages of eternity because they're now living in a place where they dreamed about, they heard about, they counted on, they looked forward to, where everything is wonderful everlastingly. But there will be an everlasting reminder of why that is so. It will be the wounds in his hands, in his feet. And his side. Look at Revelation chapter 5 and we're, we're done. The last book in the Bible. You know what the devil wants you to do? He wants to get you all consumed with, with, um, with this life and with your plans and, um, and with your, your little world. 
and with your with your wounds. Now listen, I'm, I'm not minimizing anybody's wounds and anybody that's lived any length of time, man, we've all got them. And sometimes they are our fault, sometimes they're not our fault. But you know, uh, we live in a world that is just, they live consumed with their wounds. But I think, you know what, the Lord will really, really, he's trying to draw your attention away from that. And he's saying, don't, don't forget, I was wounded for your transgressions. Look at Revelation 5, verse 9. And John is seeing eternity. And he said, and they sung a new song. Man, singing is not just a formality. It's something that the redeemed do it's 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 a it's a sign of joy but you know it's it's something that we're going to do there and they sung a new song saying thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof for thou speaking to jesus thou was slain you know in eternity that's never forgotten thou was slain and hast redeemed us to god it was your wounds that saved us, redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and has made us into our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands saying, with a loud voice. Now, John, he's telling you what he keeps hearing. Worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard, I saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth on the throne and unto the lamb forever and ever. That's what he that's what he heard. But verse 6 tells us what he saw. And I beheld and lo in the midst of the throne, you know that everlasting kingdom, there's a throne there. And that's the center of everything in eternity. In the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain. John saw, he heard all this, and he heard all this praise to the lamb. And, you know, the lamb was that, that animal of sacrifice. And, you know, Jesus comes on the scene and in, you know, at the age of 30 years old. And John the Baptist says, behold, the lamb of God, which take away the sin of the world. But here, John is in heaven and he sees a lamb as it had been slain. He sees this lamb and it's, it's a lamb as if it's already been slain. It's bleeding, it's wounded, and it has died. But notice it says there, it says, there stood a lamb. And here's this lamb. And he's wounded. And he has died. But he is standing. He is standing. Everlasting arms. And an everlasting kingdom. And everlasting wounds and everlasting life. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. You remember when Jesus walked the earth in John chapter 11, there was one of those great days where he raised someone from the dead and he raised Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus had been dead four days, graveyard dead. And he shows up on the scene and he's about to raise Lazarus from the dead. But Mary and Martha don't realize that the funeral is underway. Everybody's weeping and wailing and and it's a terrible dark time, just like any funeral is. And Jesus looks at Martha and he said, I am the resurrection. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead. Yet shall he live. 
And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Shall never die. You say, well, preacher, how can that be? We're, we're all going to die. Um, you know what death is for a believer? The Bible says, um, as the body without the spirit is dead. And that's what physical life is. You know, if, if you're in the hospital and you're, on, you know, you're laying there and you're on life support and they unplug you, you know, and all that. Um, what, what is, what is you is that spirit within you. I mean, you, you live in your body, but the real you is inside. And, um, and you breathe that last breath and your, your spirit leaves. But one of the ways that Jesus used to describe death for the people that loved him was it was like falling asleep. It was like falling asleep. You know, when he came to Lazarus grave, he was when he made the decision to go there, he looked at his disciples and he said, uh, we need to uh, we need to go see Lazarus. Well, the disciples were used to that because Jesus often stayed with Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And um, and he said, our friend Lazarus sleeping. And they said, Lord, why, why would we go bother him if he's sleeping? If he's sleeping, he's fine. And it says, then Jesus said plainly, Lazarus is dead. Stephen is stoned in the book of Acts for Jesus Christ. And the crowd is wailing those rocks at him, you know. And, and right before he dies, he, man, he sees Jesus Christ at the right hand of God. And, and it says... And Stephen fell asleep, fell asleep. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. If you die without Christ, you, you wake up in hell and you go to that place that, that it is also everlasting where the worm dieth not, the fire is not quenched. And the Bible calls that the second death. There is no light. There's no peace. There's no water. It's just the blackness of darkness and weeping and wailing forever. But the Lord said, he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. And then he said to Martha, believest thou this? And that's really the question this morning. You know, uh, the the resurrection is more than a story. It is. It's a true story. Uh, do you believe it? Um, but, but you know, it, it's more than just, wow, you know, yeah, I, I think I believe that. No, uh, the, the kind of believing that Jesus always talked about was the kind of belief that would change everything. This kind of belief that would make a person change their whole, it would make them turn. It would make them change their, their mind about everything. And they would turn to him. Do you believe like that? It's got to be more than historical fact. It's got to be something that makes you call on His name. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Do you believe it? Do you, you believe He died for you? Do you believe He rose from the dead? Believest thou this? He offers you everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death. That's the paycheck you get for your life without God. The wages of sin is is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And he offers you life. This life's going to be over. And you know, you, you may not live to 70 or 80. You, know, you never know when that day is going to come. And he offers you as a gift. You can't earn it. You don't get baptized into it. You don't, you don't join a church and get it. You don't be a good boy and get it. No, there's no way we can ever make up for all the sinful things we've done, thought, said, or not done. No way on earth. And he offers you something everlasting. This whole day, you know what it's about? It's about everlasting life. He said, I have the keys of hell and death. He says, you want to stay out of hell? He said, come with me. He said, I have the key. Believest thou this. There's four words that will change your life. He died for us. That, that changes a lot of things. You say, well, you know, I believe he died for the world. Well, that's good. But that's not the question. It doesn't change anything in your life until you say he died for 
can be. Do you believe that? What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, preacher, that's so simple. Yeah, it's so simple. People trip over it and they wind up in hell because they, they, they won't accept it. But Jesus made it so simple that a child could get it. Would you believe on him? That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. He offers you today, this moment, everlasting life. You can have it in 60 seconds. If you just swing your heart open and say, Lord Jesus, I don't even understand all this, but I want it. If you're going to change my life, whatever you're going to do, I want it. Lord, I want what you offer. Please give me everlasting life. Would you do it this morning? Let's pray. Lord, you were wounded for our transgressions. Lord, you were the payment because we could never pay that debt. Lord, you are God and you live forever. And Lord, this morning, you offer people eternal life. Lord, anybody in this room, Lord, that doesn't know for sure that they have that. Lord, would you help them right now to call on your name as best they know how. And Lord, would you help them just to simply put their trust in Jesus Christ? Lord, help us as your people. And Lord, may we rejoice, Lord, in everlasting life, the everlasting arms, an everlasting kingdom. In Jesus' name. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, the piano is going to play. If God has spoken to you this morning, why don't you talk to him?
Father, bless this truth to our hearts today, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.